Well, thank you folks for joining us. I have my best friend here in town, uh, John Sturkin, with me tonight for my audience of one. And uh, I wanted to give you a mission update. Many of you know that we're home missionaries with Twin Cities Creation Science Association, and we appreciate them. Been with them almost 30 years now as a home missionary. And one of the things that God had laid on my heart after my first wife passed away was the possibility of going to China. Several things developed. I have a list of six things that seemed to be that God was guiding me back to China. When I was in seminary in uh, 1965, I took on then being a missionary, I felt maybe God was calling me to a mission uh, outreach to China then, but of course there was the bamboo curtain and everything was closed down. No one went in, no one came out. After Tricia died, I met my new wife now, but uh, God brought her into my life and uh, she's Chinese. Some of you have seen her picture. You'll see that in a minute. Uh, let me go to, there we go. There she is there. And um, there's over here, my great grandparents were missionaries there in 1890. This is my grandmother, Esther. She was born in China, and she used to tell me stories about China and that. And so I was always been interested in China when I was in seminary. I attended the Chinese Baptist Church in Portland, Oregon, and uh, again, had a great interest in China. As many of you know, we had to cancel our trip the last minute to Taiwan uh, in February. We were going to go there for two or three weeks. And of course, with the pandemic and the airplanes shutting down and things, we had to cancel. Uh, a second thing that I'm working on, my friend John, who's with us today, uh, had been before the pandemic working at a rest home. And he plays the saxophone and was ministering to the folks there with that. They finally asked him if he might work part time to try to get the uh, elderly men, the older men, out of their bedrooms and come out and interact with people. Uh, you know, the, the ladies have their uh, sewing and, and crochet and things like that, but the men just kind of hunker down in their rooms. Well, we kind of had the idea, I, I was already kind of thinking about building a model railroad to use at the Juvenile Justice Center. And I built one back in the uh, 1970s when we, my first wife and I lived in Mexico. And then uh, I thought, well, maybe this is something also I could use at the Juvenile Justice Center to get the kids interested in doing something hands-on. So this is it at its present state. Uh, the, uh, the rest home, we, I, I built this to be three feet wide and five feet long. It just fits in the back of my, um, my Ford Escape or Edge, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, this represents Mount Baker and Long Jack Gold Mine uh, up in uh, Washington, Concrete, where I grew up. Here's a logging camp. And down here is the town of Concrete and the sawmill. We had two major industries in concrete. One was uh, lumber and sawmills and shakes, shingles, and uh, through the logging, as well as the building of dams to supply electricity to Seattle. And uh, then we had the cement plant that uh, made the cement that built the Grand Coulee Dam. Uh, I had the idea of making buildings out of wood scraps the kits like this one here cost about twenty to forty dollars, uh, and they ha they require cutting and scissors, and I can't use that at the juvenile justice center. So then I uh, just took scraps of wood and cut them like this to make houses. There you can see some of the houses there. Here's the cement plant, all made out of wood blocks and then painted. So it's something that I can use at the juvenile justice center. Also, uh, they can't use we can't use knives or scissors there, but they can paint and uh, give them a block and they can paint it, make their own house. And, and then also the railroad can be run as a game. They have to take what's called a way bill out and it tells them pick up, uh, you know, logs at the logging camp and take them down to the sawmill. And then we time them and see how fast they can do it. Whoever gets done first is the winner. Uh, here's the town of concrete there. Uh, this is the Shell gas station in memory of my father who ran the station for five years. And then uh, this is the sawmill where much of the lumber was made for the rest of the world. Now, also we have a, God seemed to be just before the virus opening up ministry to public schools. Now, of course, we can't go in and preach the gospel. 
or what we call creation science in the sense of naming God as the creator. But we do show them the complexity of the, of the dinosaurs and that. You're going to see this one a little bit later. I was just beginning to experiment on making it a panorama here, so that's why it's kind of curvy. But this is a 20-foot long wing of the pteranodon that we're going to look at in a few minutes, made out of PVC pipe. I call it my PVC pipe Legos. And the kids put it all together and then they wanted to get a picture there. So it gives them hands-on activities. And uh, we also did one on the mysteries of Egypt at another school, a two-day camp at the school. This is a map, four by eight foot map that they put together. It's a puzzle. And again, they learn different things uh, about Egypt and that and show the incredible engineering ability of these ancient people. And all these things are in contrast to what evolution teaches, but of course, I don't attack evolution or that. I just put out this information, especially on the dinosaurs. Then my home schools, I haven't had any classes. I'm hoping to start in October. As you know, California is a little more stringent than some of the others and has kept the lockdown way too long here. So the long-necked dinosaur and giraffe compared. We have found almost no internal organs of the dinosaurs. Uh, and so I decided to contrast the Apatosaurus or long necked dinosaur with the giraffe because their, their uh, needs are very similar. Just one aside here. I used to start with a picture, I'll show it to you in a minute, of a giant snake with people standing around it. This one is actually a real picture from a newspaper that I saw in a book about 30 years ago in the library there at uh, uh, Brooklyn Center. I went back uh, to get it. I wanted to get a picture of it. I didn't have a camera with me at the time and they'd thrown the book away. This is a drawing based on that newspaper article from Dario de Pernambuco in Brazil, uh, 1948. A 60 foot long uh, snake that they killed that had come into the village. So this one is not Photoshopped, but this one is. <laughs> You can see the actual photograph they used here and then they superimposed it here with the people standing around looking at it. So I used to use this in my class and then I thought I better look up and see if that's a Photoshop or what. Now, we're gonna go to a list of customizations of the giraffe and apply those to the dinosaur. Now I'm gonna have to move this down, there we go. Okay, there we go. Uh, when a full grown 19 foot tall giraffe lowers its neck to drink and then raises itself upright, its head changes from seven feet below to 12 feet above the heart. Specially designed blood vessels or pipes are used to keep the blood flowing properly at all times. And uh, folks, I'm using, you know, some sixth grade language words here because uh, hopefully we've got some young people logging on. And so I've tried to use not too much technical data here. Number one, the customized heart. The giraffe's heart is the size of a basketball and weighs about 25 pounds. It's 40 times bigger as a human heart. This is the heart model of the 100 foot long blue whale, the biggest animal that lives today. The biggest hepatosaurus found so far was 130 feet long and weighed 80 tons. Its heart was probably bigger than this because it lived on land and of course, it, wouldn't, it would have gravity even more pulling down compared to the whale that is fairly buoyant in the water. So uh, this heart would, might even be bigger than the blue whale. Let's compare them here. Here's the 100 foot long blue whale here. The one I'm referring to is called Titanosaurus from Argentina, found many years ago, uh, at 130 feet long, weighing 80 tons. Here's a 737, you can see it's a little bit smaller than the giant Titanosaurus. So God has created a customized heart and blood system for the giraffe as, and I'm gonna compare that and assume that it's very similar to the uh, Apatosaurus here. Here's our artery, the red one, and then our veins bringing the blood back from the brain to the heart, or, and of course the lungs and that for uh, oxygen. Second is the customized neck artery. Of course, uh, uh, 
just to review, the artery is the, the one that carries the blood away from the heart. It's more than an inch in diameter in the giraffe. So if you think about a hose that you use to water the lawn or the garden, it's as big as a hose. The artery acts as a blood reservoir. It's slightly collapsed when the giraffe's head is up. So the blood can flow into it at low pressure uh, when the head is lowered. The patasaurus neck, uh, I'm assuming it's going to start out about nine inches. That's the size coming out of the heart of the blue whale. And it's going to be 40 feet long. And again, I'm assuming that by the time it reaches the brain and in that area, it's, it's narrowed down to two inches. And of course, it'll get smaller to wrap around the brain to provide the blood there. I use this pipe here, uh, painted red, to represent the, the coming out of the heart and gives you a little bit of the size there. I couldn't bring Core Scout, I was gonna bring some of these to Minnesota, not this, but some of these things and get some things there to have in the class when we taught there at Northwestern, but uh, I took pictures. My friend John helped me take pictures of these and show you what they look like. So this is a piece of, uh, uh, th a three inch piece of irrigation pipe. And then I made duplicates of it. So. Uh, to show you the size and length of this, that's, that's what's hard to do is to show the size of this. Uh, I'm holding it here and then I added these on to show it 40 feet long. This is to help visualize it there. And this is where everybody goes, ooh, that's big, okay? You guys got to interact with me back there at home now. So how big is the neck? Now roll it out and see. Well, of course, we can't roll it out here. Uh, this is what I used at the Secular Museum over at Bakersfield, Kern County Museum. We had about 40 kids there for a one-day camp. So we rolled the whole length out. This is uh, Amy, my faithful helper here now. She's been a great help, and God has just used her tremendously in my life, and I'm so thankful for her. Anyway, we rolled it out. Well, John and I rolled it out on this uh, warehouse uh, where I have my museum, the problem is you can't see the black lettering. So I had to uh, superimpose this over it so you can see and get a feel for the size. And then here's uh, at 40 feet long. Here's again, a picture of the head fitting onto the uh, vertebrae here. Third thing that's customized. I just wanted to, to uh, remind everyone or many of you are familiar with this, but. God takes, I, I look at God as taking a basic blueprint of basically, I think, using the human blueprint and mammal blueprint, and then he customizes it for all these different animals, including reptiles and even uh, aquatic creatures and even insects. All of them tend to have very similar uh, parts to us. Some are elongated, some are added to for their specific needs. So customized valves, the val veins and arteries are fitted with an intricate system of efficient valves. They protect the animal's head from getting too much blood when its neck is lowered. So these help slow the blood down. They also help uh, push it up to the brain because this is, remember, is 40 feet long uh, compared to the, the giraffe that's 10 feet long. So there's a lot of distance there to move the blood. So I emphasize when I'm teaching, and I taught this at this Kern County, and I emphasized all these things. I just leave the word God out of it, but I talk about customized vessels, very similar to our human body. When the apatosaurus drops his head from 40 feet in the air to zero, without the special valves, his brain would rupture from the blood flow. He would literally blow out his brains. Owie, 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 it would hurt. Customized blood vessels, the blood net. This net is a complicated network of blood vessels in the neck that equalizes blood pressure when the animal bends down to drink. So it helps spread it out. It looks like this. It's interesting that the whale has the same type of net to help it when it dives. They've recorded whales going down two miles deep under the ocean and they also have this net that helps keep the blood equalized all the way uh, all along the chest of the whale. Also, 
something else I learned, the whale can actually collapse its lungs when it goes down that deep so that it can return very quickly to the surface and not get the bends. Again, very specialized design by God. This network of blood vessels, oh, there it is, yeah, serves to stabilize the blood pressure in the head. Without these two things, both of these animals could faint when lifting their heads and have a stroke when bending down to drink as the blood rushed down to the head, bursting the blood vessels. Uh, many of you had the experience of, you know, your, and, and, and my friend John, he was saying the other day, you know, when you drop something and you get down on the floor to pick it up, you think, well, while I'm down here, maybe I better check out something else before I go to all the work to get back up. And uh, we're laughing about that. Uh, but, you, you know, you bend over to tie your shoes or something sitting on the couch, and then you, if you raise your head up too quickly, you get dizzy. And so that's what this net and the specialized blood system of these animals does. Imagine if you had to raise your head 40 feet. Next customization is the skin, very specialized skin around the legs. And it prevents the blood from pooling and bleeding from cuts. And again, the giraffe has that same characteristic. And then customized leg muscles. These muscles here help pump blood upwards so that enough blood always reaches the head. So, excuse me, so they don't faint. The skin combination, those last two, have been studied extensively by NASA scientists in their development of gravity suits for astronauts. The legs support has been studied on the giraffe and is used to help create a, a pant leg that'll push the blood back up and, and go against the lack of gravity. Uh, when my wife, Tricia, was in the hospital several times, the first thing they did was to put a leg blood circulation pressure, these are, they blow them up with air on her legs to help push the blood, blood back to her heart. Big help in getting the blood flowing. Number seven is the customized neck vertebrae. The giraffe has an elongated neck vertebrae two to three times the lengths of other mammals. The giraffe has seven cervical uh, vertebrae, just as humans. But God has made them longer for the special needs of the animal for eating from tall trees. God has further customized the apatosaurus neck by elongating the vertebra and adding eight more for a total of 15. So the apatosaurus has a total of 15 neck vertebrae. This is a model I made out of plywood, and uh, you can see how big it is. It's almost four feet long. And uh, by the way, if anyone is interested in any of these models or anything on that I teach on today, such as the PVC pipe wing, uh, write me, get my name and address or the email from the website, TCCSA website or my Adventure Safaris website. Glad to send you the blueprints for any of these things. Build your own and be the envy of the neighborhood. All right, it's hard to wrap your head around how big this creature was. Here are a few more comparisons. This is a cast of a seropod footprint that I made at Faith, South Dakota. That's where T-Rex Sioux was found, and we had a, a site near there where the rancher had found fossilized footprints in the ground, and we went down there and uh, made a latex mold and then cast footprints out of that. This one's about two feet away, two feet across, and the stride, the distance between the legs walking through the area there was about 10 feet from one foot to the other. This is a one that I made based on the Titanosaurus, the one found in Argentina that was 130 feet long. This is the footprint here. This is made out of foam that we use, uh, people use for weight to, in their weightlifting rooms and that. Uh, I cut it up and make puzzles out of it. So we're looking at the dorsal or back vertebrae here. We're gonna look at that in a minute. The neck, we already looked at that one. And then we're gonna look at the femur hip bone here. Coming back to the neck for a few minutes, the 40 foot neck is designed like a suspension bridge. Connecting ligaments all along here are like cables that hold up the bridge. 
as we see here on the Golden Gate Bridge. A kind of an amusing thing happened. I was doing study on this many years ago and, and found this picture in a museum. And the description about the neck of the Apatosaurus used these words. It's designed like a suspension bridge. And I thought, what? <laughs> I was amazed when I read it because I thought uh, everything's supposed to be by chance and accident in the evolutionary worldview. And, and to use the design infers a designer. And I said, you guys can't use those words, design and, and blueprint and things like that. This all happened by chance and accident over billions of years, according to them. Kind of amusing to see their, their vocabulary. All right, here's the hip bone I made out of a piece of plywood. Someday I have a goal of, of casting one out of foam, but so far that hasn't happened. I did make a foam four foot long leg bone out of a piece of foam that I got out of the dumpster here because this is an industrial area that we're always throwing stuff away and I made a whole leg uh, bone for my exhibit here. The, uh, I have a hadrosaurus leg bone from South Dakota that uh, belonged to a friend of mine and they wanted it back. So I made a replica out of foam and it weighs about 12 pounds. The rock or its fossilized one weighs about 112 pounds. Now this is a blueprint I made for the vertebra of the giant Titanosaurus, and it's nine feet tall, five feet wide. And here you can see the leg bone of the Titanosaur, eight feet long, man laying next to it. Huge. This looks to me like the shoulder blade back here. They don't uh, mention it in the report. Here's a floor puzzle I made out of the vertebra that the kids will be putting together this fall in class. And hopefully next year, we have at Fremont a Chinese church. We were to last a, a year ago uh, to do a one week camp at, and uh, that was a great experience. And I was preparing this for that class in January, but it got canceled. So conclusion, God made both animals with special customized blood circulation. They had advanced blood pumping systems so their brains would not blow to pieces when bending down. And they wouldn't pass out as they lifted their head. This amazing design and engineering shows God's handiwork. This shows God's attribute of omniscience, all-knowing. He knew how to make the giraffe and long neck in the best possible way. Now we're going to move on to Pteranodon and bats compared. This is the Pteranodon Quetzalcoatlus Northropi with a 40-foot wingspan there in the St. Paul Museum. Many uh, ask a show of hands how many have been there, seen that up in the, hanging up in the ceiling. <laughs> we're, we're trying to be interactive here a little bit. Uh, and uh, the fossils were found in Texas. Interesting, at the same time I was developing this program, uh, I discovered this at the St. Paul Museum. That particular year we had a one-day safari there and several other things came together as I was preparing uh, to teach this same program uh, on Beowulf, who we'll come to in a few minutes. Just a little bit here on names. Uh, pterodactyl is a generalized name because I went to uh, a, a museum in Texas and they had the same model of the uh, Quetzalcoatlus Northropi hanging from their ceiling. And I said, some people call it a pteranodon, some call it a pterodactyl. What, what's the difference? And I asked the guide there and they didn't know. <laughs> Here's the difference. Pterodactylus has teeth, okay? Pterodactyl is like saying it's a, it's a dog, okay? And uh, then pterodactylus is the subspecies, like uh, I have a dog and it's a Samoyed, or I have a dog and it's a, uh, um, what's the black one? <laughs> Labrador Retriever. All right, so um, we have uh, ones with teeth, they're called pterodactylus. Ones without teeth are pteranodon. As I was doing the research though, there's still a lot of discussion and disagreement amongst the paleontologists as to what to name some of these some days. Uh, you know, we get it cut and dried in the books and in the uh, Scientific American and what's the other one, John's Discovery Magazine. Uh, oh, this is what they've decided, you know, and yet behind closed doors, they're still arguing over a lot of these things. All right, the reconstruction of the wing that Doug Lawson discovered in Texas is made of fiberglass cast. So there's a reconstruction of it 
the brown areas here are the actual fossil, and then they re rebuilt it based on uh, a smaller uh, pteranodon that they have a lot more parts for. The big one, they, they don't have too many parts for. You can see uh, a lot of it's de degenerated there. It was about the size of a giraffe. This is a baby about four inches long. I got this from Joe Taylor, uh, my friend in Texas. Many of you know him. Uh, this is a reproduction and it shows the pterodactyl uh, walking on its front legs here again. And um, so they all start out small from an egg. Well, we don't even know if it's from an egg. This model shows how small it was when it was born. Uh, we've never found any egg fragments or any eggs of pterodactyls. If they are a mammal, which I think they are, uh, then they evidently have live birth. The biggest pteranodon found so far was 50 feet long with a wingspan of 40 feet. How big is that? We're going to put a wing together and show you that in a minute, but first we have to practice uh, our body parts. So if you want to put your hand back of your neck there, that's your scapula or shoulder blade. Then our next uh, arm here, uh, the, the upper arm is our humerus. Then we have our radius and ulna. I remember it this way, radius, uh, the outer bone radiates away like the thumb. The inner bone, the ulnus, is the one that you hit, often called your crazy bone. Then we come down to our carpals, which are these along the back here, okay? And then we have our phalanges here. Now the phalanges are made up of three, um, three uh, four of our fingers are called phalanx, and these are individual bones in your fingers. And the thumb only has two phalanx. The size of the Tronodon uh, Quetzalcoatlus northropi is based on the first bone that they found called the phalanx in the little finger. Our finger, our first bone in our finger is one inch long, while this one is six feet long. That's another wow factor. Now, here's the model I built for my museum. My museum is 45 feet long, and this one is 40, long, 40 feet long, so it just barely fits in. So we're gonna go through and show you some of the parts here. Uh, from the uh, from right here, it's, it's uh, or I'm sorry, the whole wing is 40 feet long, okay. Now, I want everybody, if you can, stand up, or if you're sitting in your chair, put your hands out with your uh, hands pointing to the, your fingers pointing to the ground. Bats' wings are an extension of fingers in the hand. So if you were a bat standing up, your fingers would touch the floor. If you were a bat uh, uh, pointing your fingers downward, okay? I just illustrated it there. Now God customized the bat's fingers to make the wings. So here we see the wings. Here's the different, the phalange uh, is uh, the thumb number one, and then two, three, four, and five are the fingers here. Also, in this, we have the individual bones called the phalanx. Here's the third one in the uh, digit number three, or phalange number three. You've got one, two, three parts here, or three uh, phalanx. Now, he customized the little finger there's your little finger, so hold that one up and just imagine it being 12 feet long. For the young people at home, when you're done with the program tonight, get your ruler out and measure from your finger, your little finger, a 12 foot length from it, and then you'll know how long the wing, uh, that area is of your uh, little finger, uh, made to be 12 feet long. So, Here's the metacarpal again, which is at the back of the hand. The first phalanx, second phalanx, and third. Now, here we look at it on the model. So here's our metacarpal, five feet long. Phalanx here is six feet long. That's the first joint in your little finger. The second one is three feet long. And the last one is 16 inches. Now, we have a fourth one. It's called a, ling a winglet. All that together is 12 feet. The finger is 12 feet. Now, how many 
of you are wondering, what is a winglet? Well, this little point down here, six inches. An added fourth phalanx, God further customizes the hand and wing by adding the special bone. A winglet is a bone that can be flipped up to increase the lift of the wing, as you see here. And it's seen on airplanes today. As I say, uh, well, we'll come to that in a minute. When air falls off the end of the wing, it causes turbulence. It's called a vortex, or it creates a vortex, and it's like a small tornado. The winglet at the end of the wing prevents the vortex from forming. Now it's interesting, at the same time that I was doing this study on Beowulf, uh, I, we came to Minnesota, Trish and I came to Minnesota uh, many moons ago, many years ago, uh, and we stayed at my friend's house who flies 737s. Uh, I had noticed a protrusion on the end of the wing and asked him what it was. Just happened to see it and think about it that, that year. Uh, he called it a winglet. He explained that it stopped the vortex. Most importantly, it actually gave the wing more lift. He looked up the specs in his tech manual and his plane could lift 8,000 pounds more because of the winglets. And we were both very impressed. <laughs> That's a lot of uh, savings in weight. Well, my theory is, and is that when the pterodon goes into a dive and catches a fish, it can flip the winglet up and get more lift or, or bring the, you know, the wings up higher so that it breaks that vortex and it can actually have more lift when it pulls away from the water. Doing my research, I hit, came upon this fossil and just kind of a little sidebar here. This is a small pterosaur which was flying low and caught the fish that were found inside its gullet. Uh, you can't blow it up big enough to see the fish, but I'm assuming the paleontologists could see it when they found this. They don't tell the size of this. While it was swallowing its meal, it was attacked by a bigger fish, this guy here, which got its face ensnared in the pterosaur's membrous wings. Okay, so his face is caught in the wing here. Here you can see the long wings here and here. Again, for a long time, first of all, they said they didn't think the pterodon could even fly. They thought it was just a ground bird, like a penguin uh, or an ostrich. And then uh, you'll see a man built a model of it and it could fly, he could fly it. Secondly, they said, oh, it was too big to fly, too big to fish and probably didn't, didn't hunt fish. And now here we have a fossil that proves that it could hunt fish. Uh, there's the beak caught in the um, wing. Let's look at the thumb and the first three fingers. Here's the, they used to, they used smaller claws. They used the smaller claws of a smaller pteranodon to model these. Uh, now, so these are, if you're looking at your hand, we've got our thumb, then we have our first three uh, fingers after that. And that's what these are, fingers, uh, one, two, and three, and then of course the fourth one will be the little finger. These are claws that I made that I think may be about the size of this 50 foot long pterodon. They much, I think they're much bigger than the ones that I have even on my model. All right, next is the paleontologist call this a pteroid. Uh, I don't know why, I've looked and looked to try to figure out why they don't say in the literature that I could find. I call it a thumb because that's what it is and their description of it fits that of a thumb. And um, place your hand like this now, put, this, put your hand in front of you like this, place your hand for gliding. Okay, so the thumb is in the uh, hold position here. Then rising, thumb goes up and then for diving, the thumb goes down. Bend your thumb up or down on the pteranodon, it was like the flap on the wing. So it can glide, rise, or dive. And many have proposed that idea. And uh, again, there's a lot of disagreement about all these things. All right, now here we have the humerus, which is your main 
arm here, your, the, the first part of your arm, okay? Then the radius and ulna. And ulna, there's the crazy bone there that if you hit, it hurts you. Uh, we call it our crazy bone, okay? Now also, the neck here, coming out here, joins to the ribs and torso down here. And on humans, uh, we're very flexible, so we can turn and twist and things like that. On the pteranodon, they claim, and uh, they, you know, with the smaller ones, that they say that this is all joined together. It's very, it's like a barrel, uh, very tight, because they need to put all their movement into the, you can see this large part of the bone here, that's where the muscles attach to go clear out on the arm to flap the wings. And so it's not flexible like a human. Just like the bat, there is no furcula. Birds have a furcula that helps act like a spring to move the wings. And that's one more reason why I believe it's a mammal. Bats don't have furculas. Here's a comparison of arms, which show God again using a basic design, but customizing it for each creature. Here's the pterodactyl bird bat with the long fingers. There's its thumb. Uh, there's a dolphin, the uh, human over here. All we, we all have these same bones, but sometimes larger, sometimes stronger, thicker, things like that. As we see in other animal species, there were many varieties of pteranodons. <clears throat> this is the one I patterned mine off after with this high head crest. Now, the head and beak are eight feet long. The head crest is hollow and they have acted like a rudder for turning. Again, several have put forth that idea. Here's the neck. It's 10 feet long and it's hollow with internal struts and very light. The neck bones and the wing bones and uh, I'm assuming the leg bones, I haven't really studied the legs, but uh, most of the bones are very similar to birds. They're totally hollow and very thin inside. There are seven neck vertebrae, just like a human, and giraffes, but again, elongated, as I showed you there with the... Oh, I'm going to show you. No. The neck of a pelican, ostrich, and pteranodon are very similar. Bones of an ostrich neck. Uh, when I lived in Minnesota, a family lived out of town who raised ostriches, and one died, and they said, do you want the skeleton? And me, being a collector of anything, <laughs> said, yes, that would be great. And my whole goal was eventually to clean it all up and put it up uh, in my museum. And it's been hanging up in a barn for the last 16 years, and they, people are moving, and I had to get everything out. Well, I thought, um, and I got the neck and, and cleaned it up here, and I thought, wow, this is just like the Apatosaurus neck. So again, it's like God brings these things together at the right time, just like he brought the uh, pilot into my life at the right time to explain what a winglet was. And this is a close-up of the neck vertebra. These are called sliders here. And synovial fluid is exuded, exuded there as grease to keep the neck movement smooth. We all humans have that. Uh, you know, when you're Grandfather says, you know, my knees are squeaking. <laughs> That's be it's, they are, because they, the body isn't producing as much synovial fluid. Now, I'm going to show you here, and I'm going to leave this. All right. And show you up close the vertebrae. Here, I'll hold it here. You can see the sliders here. And they come in and they slide back and forth so it can raise and lower its neck. Can, they'll actually twist a little bit. I saw a demonstration of that on the video. And so these uh, sliders are what give its neck its movement. And as I looked at it, and I'll show you here. We're back, okay. As I looked at it, when I was preparing it, I thought, wow, these are exactly like the Pteranodon, only theirs, the pteranodon is much longer. Here's one I made out of cement uh, that's two feet long. 
And again, we see the customization by God of the neck vertebrae to meet the needs of this creature. And again, remember, it has the same number of vertebrae, uh, cervical vertebrae, as a human, seven. Here's the drawings of the different uh, neck parts. Um, here's our ostrich, and here are the interlocking parts. These all interlock together. This is the longest one at two feet here. Here's my model. I made, I, I made a whole neck out of this out of cement to use uh, when we go to dinosaur, um, camps on it. So there you can see where they connect. Then here is another drawing uh, showing the sliders here that fit together to slide. Now, if you really want to know the exact name, these are called the zygopitheses and the zygopotheses. Uh, you fellows remember, you know, Joe Taylor, I learned that from him almost 30 years ago now. Uh, when I was first digging at his dinosaur dig, I said, well, what are these called? He said, zygopotheses, zygopitheses. So I wrote it down, and that night in my tent, I, I memorized it so I'd look really smart the next day. So that was great fun. Now there's variety in size. Again, here we have an eight foot long head, neck is 10 feet long, wingspan 32 to 40 feet long. Why? Oops, sorry, there we go. Now, now that we know about the bones of this creature, we're going to give you a look at the organs based on the bat. We will contrast and compare a pteranodon to the bat. The biggest shown here is the fox bat with a six foot wingspan. Bat fossils are claimed to be 50 million years old. Yet there is one different, here's one that I've gotten, uh, bought at a, a fossil store, a reproduction, and it hasn't changed, and they admit it, it hasn't changed in 50 years. And so it's like, I mean, 50 million years. <laughs> it's like, well, how come they haven't changed? Evolution says everything's, you know, slowly changing into something else over billions of years. Now, here's a photo of the hollow bone showing the struts inside the bone walls. There's the struts, and there's the thickness of the walls, and they say these are about the thickness of a soda bottle. Uh, I made one myself. You can do this at home, make your own, be the envy of the neighborhood, again. Um, I took pieces of um, skewer, I guess it was, yeah. Uh, shish kebab skewers, cut them up, glued them in there. When you get them glued in there and then you hold the bottle in your hand, and try to crunch it, it won't crunch down. And it's, uh, when I was in carpentry, we used to build, have trusses that would go across for the, underneath the floors of houses. And those trusses um, were very much like these struts and very strong. Here's a three quarter inch part of one of the bones in the pterodon. And again, you can see the struts here. Here's the inside of a cow bone, which is similar to a human hip bone. This is the cow's hip bone or femur. You can see how thick the bone wall is here. Very thick. And ours are almost comparable. Humerus of the pteranodon is 21 inches. The humerus of the human is compared at 14 inches. Again, God has elongated it, made it bigger and heavier for its bigger job. Here's my PVC pipe, uh, 20 foot long wing. And uh, again, if you're interested in the blueprints for that, send me a note, I'll send it to you. It explains all the different links and all the different parts. Here's the humerus here showing that. Great fun. Now, when they said they can't fly, this man many years ago built a model of it, doesn't explain what he made it out of and everything, and it was able to fly. Now, at that time, they were saying the animal was 180 pounds, and when I heard this, I thought, boy, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty, pretty light. You know, I couldn't believe an animal 50 feet long would be that. Now they have bumped it up to 440 pounds. Uh, being, I didn't do a study of the, the mass of a bat, that six uh, foot wingspan bat, fox bat, to uh, its mass to size. That would be a good study. Bats use microscopic wing hairs to sense the speed and direction of air flowing over their wings. 
Our planes have instruments called PITO, P2 tubes that perform the same role. I think, John, you said you've seen them on the airplanes you worked on. John was in the Air Force, more in electronics with the radios and that, but he walked by these all the time. Now, when the pterodon was first found in 1843, paleontologist Edward Newman thought the pteranodons were giant mammals similar to bats and drew this picture of the creature. He had found fossil traces of fossilized hair. So this is a drawing from 1843. So why hasn't it been acclaimed as a giant flying mammal? I found this in uh, another site. It says most of all ter pterosaurs, that's pterodactyls and uh, pterodactylus and pteranodons, uh, had hair-like filaments known as pycofibers on their wings. And of course, you can guess what they're going to say this is. They claim these are hairs evolving into feathers. But I guess they don't know about human hairs with split ends. That's what it looks like to me. Uh, anyway, I've done a whole lesson. I haven't done it at TCCSA, but I've done it on a T-Rex that it have feathers. And I look at the feathers, at hairs, and folded skin, which reptiles have, and shown how those are very different and distinct structures. So here, I've made a list of why the pteranodon is not a mammal, according to evolutionists. Though they, uh, though they are, are very hair-like, they are interpreted to be feathers because scientists assume these four things. The pteranodon was a reptile living in Jurassic times with no mammals existed. No mammals existed at the time. Though it has mammal characteristics, it can't be one, as it's found in the wrong strata. And I've heard that about other dinosaurs too. Uh, that I think were mammals, but they said, no, 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 it's in the wrong strata. Uh, it is assumed that dinosaurs evolved into birds over billions of years, so uh, millions of years. So uh, they find anything that looks like they can interpret as a, uh, as a feather, then that's definitely showing and reinforcing their idea. Uh, they claim this hair is evolving into feathers. We maintain that hair, feathers, and reptile skin are very different structures. And if you're interested in that lesson, uh, write to me and I'll send you the whole thing on a PDF file. Mammal interpretation is rejected because it not, does not fit the evolutionary presuppositions. Paleontolo paleontologist Paul Serino and others have inferred this. It can't be a mammal because they did not live at the same time as dinosaurs. Now, God made flying creatures to have specialized blood systems. The muscle walls here, and here's the blood vein inside. Bats have a customized blood pumping circulatory system. The muscle walls of the veins squeeze, and hope you can see that, keep pushing and squeezing the vein. They contract to help push the blood back to the lungs so oxygen can be added quickly into the blood cells. We as humans don't have that, and most of the mammals don't have that, but the bats do. Uh, I was just watching a, uh, when Amy and I had, I had dinner today, I was watching a hummingbird outside the house there. They love the flowers we have here. And uh, I thought, man, I'd like to do a whole lesson on hummingbirds. They're probably very similar to, uh, to the bat and pterodactyl because they need tremendous amount of oxygen. I looked it up on uh, Siri and she said they need, they beat, uh, 1,000 times per second their wings. Well, that's a tremendous amount of energy needed to fly like that. Bats have a customized breathing system to cope with the demands of flight. Flapping the wings requires large amounts of energy, which requires a large continuous flow of oxygen. In bat wings, which are customized arms, there are more veins and arteries than in humans. They need a tremendous amount of blood flow to the wing. Humans can only get oxygen into the blood through the lungs, but bats not only get it from the lungs, but the blood vessels under the thin skin of the wings can actually absorb oxygen. So if you look at your arm and the blood vessels there, it, they've got to go back to the lungs and get the oxygen. Whereas on the bat, and I'm assuming on the pterodactyl or pteranodon, 
they have to, they can get blood right out, I mean, oxygen into the blood out there on the wing. Hyperoxygenated, maybe we could term that word, uh, have that term. With the fox bat, you can see the large blood vessels visible against the light. Also, note the thumbs up here. We assume the same thing in this wing. Uh, on the pteranodon. It takes a lot of fast moving blood to work the flight muscles of bats. Blood supply to the wing requires double the amount compared to human muscles. The body of the bat is the size of a cat, of the fox bat. The bat's heart is three times larger than the cat for an animal of this size and actually pumps more blood. A human runner's heart is about 100 to 170 beats per minute. Now, just in your own mind, those are uh, you folks on the other side there. Guess how fast for a bat uh, is pumping? How fast is its heart pumping? Here's our runners jogging along. John, you you did a lot of running and on your bicycle too. Did you ever uh, uh, test your heart when you're riding a bike? What did you? Remember what you 170? About 170, yeah, 180, yeah. Well, with the bat, it's 1,000 beats per minute. So it's really, really trucking. Now, the question is, are they alive today? And as I say, as I was doing research, I was actually doing research on Beowulf and all these other things came together. The trip to Minnesota to see the skeleton in the building there talking to my airline pilot friend. Best written history of Pteranodon. This takes place around 300 to 500 AD in Denmark. And eventually uh, Beowulf actually comes to uh, England. Now Beowulf is written in old, 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 old English. Uh, how many remember Canterbury's Tales and studying that in high school literature, I remember that. And we also studied Beowulf. Canterbury Tales is what I call old, old English. You know, you can read it and you get most of it and most of the words you understand. Beowulf is old, 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 old English. And you may see one word on a page <laughs> that you understand. Now I looked up on the internet, various translations of Beowulf and other, all of them were very, very difficult to read. Uh, and I mean, they had the ancient English, and then they had the uh, modern English. Uh, but the modern English was very jilted and very stiff. This Beowulf by Seamus Henney, uh, I highly recommend it. It is just very, what I call very smooth. It's really fun to read. And the words, the English translation is very smooth and understandable. This man, Bill Cooper, uh, was another book that came in about this time. God does lead us to the, it's like an archeology span date, leads us to these different things. Uh, and he shows that Beowulf is a historically accurate record. And I really recommend this to folks to read because he not only talks about Beowulf, but uh, a lot of history uh, showing these historical figures. And he traces Beowulf and his relatives clear back to some of them leaving Rome uh, I believe, yeah, before the uh, time of Jesus. So it's a great read for that purpose. I actually corresponded him, with him several times asking more questions about it. He was a very generous and helpful man. Uh, and you can get his book here or, or uh, actually download it. Now from Beowulf, it says this huge burial cave had been made into a lair by a fire breathing creature called the wide fire or the old English is wood floca. And that's the line number there. It records there in Beowulf, swaddled in flames it came gliding and flexing and racing towards its fate. Beowulf set out to kill this flying creature that breathed fire. Yet his shield defended the renowned leader's life and limb. So he hid, hid behind his shield as the creature tried to destroy him with his hot breath. Other records of the fire breathing creatures, Levi uh, Leviathan in Job chapter 41. Fire and sparks 
leak from its mouth. Smoke streams from its nostrils like steam from a boiling pot on a fire of dry rushes. Yes, its breath would kindle coals for flames shooting from its mouth. We also have in the King James scriptures from Isaiah, it's mentioned twice as the fire, fiery flying serpent. And the Hebrew flying is translated seraphim, uh, which just means flutterers. And you remember there's three types of angels. Angels simply means messengers. You have uh, the angels like uh, Michael and uh, Gabriel, <laughs> my mind went blank. John's helping me though, that's all right. Um, he gets paid extra for that. Uh, Gabriel, uh, they had no wings. The ones that appeared to people on earth tended and didn't have wings. But then you have the cherubim that are on the Ark of the Covenant. They had each had a set of wings. And then in heaven, the seraphim that never come to earth had six wings or three pairs. Anyway, the Hebrew word used seraph means to fly or flutter. The same words fiery seraph is employed in Numbers 21.6 to describe the poisonous reptiles that bit the murmuring Israelites. And um, I was reading a commentary about this, and it said it's easier to envision an attack of nimble flying pterosaurs killing many of the children of Israel rather than being surprised and killed by snakes on the ground. And I thought, well, yeah, if you had a bunch of snakes coming into town, couldn't you just, you know, chop their heads off with a shovel? That's what we used to do out at our dinosaur dig if a rattler came into our dig. So when we look at the pterodactyl, here's my idea based on some other information you'll see in a minute. The head crest is hollow and may have had chemicals to breathe fire. Pteranodon sternbergi is a, is a subspecies of the pteranodon, named after the one who unearthed it evidently, has this head crest and could breathe, maybe could breathe fire. How can we say this? Most of you are probably familiar with this idea. The duck-billed dinosaur, which is one we dug out at, the, at uh, North South Dakota for, uh, oh, well, the last one we dug for eight years at the uh, lemon. The duck bill had several chambers in its crest and may have breathed fire. You can see the whole uh, the chambers up here. Now, based on a living example, the bombardier beetle, bombardier beetle, special chemicals to defeat attackers. How does he do it? Well, he has hydrogen peroxide, hydroquinone, and these are in two separate bags. When they are combined here, they shoot out the rectum at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. That'll burn you. And if you want to go on the internet and look up Bombardier Beetle, now they have a actual video of it spraying out this uh, hot vapor against its enemies. Just a little sidebar here, this movie called Dinotopia uh, which was a mini series on television, lasts about three nights, two hours each night. Uh, I believe you can still get it on uh, DVD or maybe uh, through um, YouTube or something. Anyway, I love the part where the ride, they ride on the pterodactyls called skybacks. Great fun. Did you ever see that one? No. This is a model in a German museum, shows how the wings hinge and rotate at the joint between the metacarpal down here and the little finger right there. So again, and I was glad in the book, uh, there was a book written and then made a new movie, Dinotopia, that they showed them walking on the ground. Uh, and uh, that, that's, I guess, the main reason I liked the movie. It was a very uh, practical in understanding these creatures flying and walking. Uh, again, if you're interested in making a model, uh, write to me and I'll send you the blueprint for that. So conclusion, the pteranodon may have been a mammal. I think it points, everything points to it being a mammal. If true, much of its anatomy was probably like a bat's. And we can see God's wonderful engineering design and handiwork in both animals. I was wondering about that book. Um, mm -hmm after the flood, 
how do you know that that is, um, you know, it's a European history uh, shortly after the, uh, after Noah. How do you know that that is uh, accurate history? Uh, good question, yes. Uh, Mr. Cooper went through the whole story of Beowulf. And he, uh, originally Beowulf, when I was taught it in high school back in the 60s, they said this was written by Catholic monks uh, a thousand years after it happened to when they came to England to present the gospel. And they wrote it as a way of saying, hey, look, you guys, you, you had something about God here through this, this uh, story. And they claimed that the monks just made the story up. Well, Mr. Cooper went through and documented every name and every location in Beowulf, and every name is in other history books, in English history in that. And so uh, also, uh, that's just a narrow part, the part about uh, Beowulf that he covers, but there's other chapters talking about the history of uh, his ancient relatives coming from uh, Rome at, at uh, one or 200 BC. And again, he has been able to document that very well in this book, uh, to show that these are real historical people using other sources. So that's an excellent question and uh, a good Berean question. Who, who was Beowulf? Beowulf was, uh, originates in Denmark and he is a, uh, almost seems superhuman, but he has tremendous strength. I've done again a whole uh, 400 slide presentation on Beowulf. Again, if you write to me, I can send you some of that uh, in a PDF file. Was but, he a human being? Is that the name of a oh, human yeah. being? Yeah, he just, uh, he's a, he's a, basically a geet, which now we call Sweden. He was Swedish. Uh, or, I'm sorry, yeah, Swedish. A Viking. Uh, yeah, Viking type, yep. But this is about, um, I believe, 300 AD when he gets to Denmark. He heard about this creature that was marauding the people in Denmark. And he came from Sweden uh, because he had killed already giant creatures there and came to build, kill this one. Uh, the creature was called Grendel in the book. And Mr. Cooper goes to great lengths to show that this Grendel is more likely a small T-Rex. And he shows petroglyphs and uh, actual drawings of things found in churches uh, that date back to that time that show a creature that I think we can interpret to be a T-Rex. And so uh, that's why the book is so valuable in that it very, he very well documents information uh, outside of Beowulf to show that it's a real story, not something made up that I learned when I was in uh, high school. Thank you. Yep. Be sure if you you know and you have more questions, my email is there on the TCCSA site, and uh, glad to send you more information. Love to get it out. On the bat, you know, bats don't look like birds. Was that a kind? I mean, it doesn't look like you know the, all the various birds we have. Oh uh, yeah. That, the bat looks, you're saying, well, first of all, you're saying bats are mammals and then birds are birds? Is yes, that yes. Mm -hmm. so, so a bat is not really a bird, even though it flies. Right, it really correct. More like a, like a, it looks more like a mouse or something, a mouse with wings or something. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the fox bat looks like a fox. Its face looks like a fox. It has very sharp teeth. Uh, I did a study on, you know, God made three basic groups, the uh, water groups, land group, and air groups, right? But in each of these, he made a few mammals to fly in the air. He made a few mammals to live in the ocean. And of course, he made lots of mammals to live on, the, the, on land. But we have mammals, you know, porpoise and uh, whales and uh, what else? I guess those are our main mammals in the water. And we have mammals that fly. We have the, of course, the bat, which is a, a totally flying creature. Uh, we have the um, 
flying squirrel, which actually doesn't have wings, but it, you know, it, it glides down. Uh, have you ever seen glider snakes? I saw this. I, I can't believe it. Look up glider snakes. They actually have a flare around their neck. They flare that out. They'll climb up a tree and they can drop 20 feet and, and, and control their drop down to the ground. So there's, there's snakes that can glide just like a gliding squirrel. That blew me away. So God, again, every time they try to put God in a box and say, oh, well, these are just, these can only live on the ground. God says, oh, no, I can make things that do other things. Uh, it reminds me of the spider. If you look up a uh, water spider, they actually go down in the water. They blow a bubble of, somehow get a bubble of air down there, and they have their nest under the water. It's a spider, though. It's a land insect, but yet it can go down in the water. Amazing things like that. Uh, wow. Maybe that's another program next year, all the amazing <laughs> uh, designs that God has created. Good question, though. I was thinking when you showed the, um, the distribution of the blood so that it wouldn't cause the dying. Oh, hemorrhage. Yeah, know, hemorrhage. It, it, it looked a lot like the circle of Willis in the human brain in the back oh. of the you know how it you'd have to look at the human anatomy but yeah it, it, it as you were talking about how common god has kind of a common pattern right in the some of the part of the human brain there's that circle of willis where everything kind of uh -huh. spreads out and distributes so okay yeah i wasn't familiar with that but that's that's good yeah, yeah. well that's why whenever they you know people want to limit god and say well that's not possible. And then God creates an animal that <laughs> does that very, you know, the same, the thing that they're saying can't be done. And then they study it. I, I you know, the army has been studying the dragonfly for years. Uh, the dragonfly can fly at almost dragonfly speed, 60 miles an hour. It can make right hand and left hand right angle turns at 60 miles an hour. And if the helicopter did that, uh, you know, you know what would happen to the pilots. <laughs> And the dragonfly can stop instantly. Uh, and of course, if you were in a car flying at, driving at 60 miles an hour and stopped instantly, you'd go right through the window. And the dragonfly's organs and things uh, don't slide to the front and smash its head. And so they've been studying the dragonfly for years to figure out how they can make their helicopters fly as good as a simple little, quote, simple little dragonfly. And I just laugh about these things because they're studying the major universe designers designs uh, of a little tiny dragonfly so that they can make a better helicopter. Have they actually measured the number of heartbeats of a bat? Because it's a thousand beats per second or minute. It seems yeah. like almost, almost, almost impossible to do that. I mean, have they, have they actually measured that or are they just estimating or what? That's a good question. Uh, maybe maybe Dr. Ross can tell us <laughs> how they figure out the beats. Uh, yeah, it'd be kind of hard to hold the the uh, arm of a flying bat to to test his pulse. Uh, I don't know how they do that. That's a good question. Uh, again, uh, it's what I found on the internet. It doesn't have four chambers, does it? The, the bat heart, like the human heart, or, or oh, does yeah. It? yeah, all oh, mammals have four chambers. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Because I know the human heart, if it beats too fast, it doesn't have enough time to relax and fill. Ah, well, that's another important thing that would be a great research project uh, for science fair. <laughs> uh, on the heart, that's a great uh, observation and a good, it would be great to, to ch trace that down. How do they get that speed and how uh, with a, and the same thing with even like a hummingbird too, their heart is pumping tremendous amounts of blood. And that would be a good question that. Maybe uh, between now and next year, I'll do a thing on hummingbirds. Maybe I should do that. Is that what you were talking about when you said flutter? Uh, the, the, it was like it flutters. Were you thinking like how a hummingbird flutters or something well, else? Well, uh, you know, they'll say, uh, I've heard the term a, a butterfly flutters or the fluttering wings of a bird. You know, I they, see. I see. You, 
So it's a common term, I think, yeah. And that was the Hebrew word, seraph means flutter. Question about the, the neck vertebrae. I think the seven, seven neck vertebrae for the pteranodon, is that correct? But no, no, it has 15 vertebrae. The pteranodon has 15. The, um, I looked it up. Which the one giraffe has seven? seven? The giraffe has seven. Yeah. And pterodactyl? In their necks, uh, at least the pteranodon has 15. 15. I looked up, uh, my friend John and I were talking about it, and it seems like it was always an odd number. And I thought, well, is there God using an odd number pattern for all the vertebrae? But then I found out that um, the birds have anywhere from, I believe, 13 to 23. And so then I looked up a couple of birds, and a couple of them didn't have an even number. So that blew my theory, you know, like the... Uh, Bode's law that they use to find uh, the different planets. The different planets are get exponentially further apart. And so using that law, they discovered, I believe, Uranus or Neptune just by using Bode's law. Or the, uh, you, you guys are probably familiar with the Fibonacci numbers where they, uh, like on corn and, and sunflowers, there's a certain number that whirl around the center. And, and so there's a mathematical formula for those. So I was trying to see if there's a mathematical formula we could posit for the neck vertebrae using all odd numbers. But that when I did a little more research, that blew that out of water. Okay, there we go. Um, Hi, Gary. <laughs> have you heard of the book, The Parthenon Code? Uh, now, is that, there's one, that the ancients called the golden triangle, and it is built around the Parthenon. Uh, I'm not, I'm familiar with the golden triangle. That was what artists used to keep a good composition and everything they did, and they used it, they've applied it to the Parthenon. No, uh, this is a, a book that was written a while back, um, and it compared Greek mythology to the biblical account. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And there's, some interesting correlations be between those. I was just wondering if you had heard of it, what you thought of it, if you had heard of it. Yeah, I hadn't heard of that one, but I've done a lot of study on ancient literature. I mean, like the um, Gilgamesh epic, you've probably all heard about that, that does record uh, certain things that are in the Bible. Again, and I, I have a whole, you know, I have 24 lessons on Egypt, and I've done a lot of research on their literature, and again, they have many things that are similar to the Bible. Now, again, the evolutionists will say Moses uh, copied from the, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Moses used a lot of their stuff to write the Ten Commandments and things like that, but again, I did a study where, remember, Joseph married the not of the, the uh, married the daughter of the priest of Hierapolis, one of the major religious centers. I have envisioned him having discussions with his father-in-law over biblical things. And um, again, they claim that a lot of the Egyptian culture influenced Moses. And I say that Joseph started influencing the <laughs> culture because mm -hmm. Hierapolis had uh, things that are, they had a uh, flood story and a creation story that parts of it are very similar to the Bible. And of course, it's been corrupted over thousands of years after the flood. And so uh, I believe, and I tell kids that, you know, Moses was influenced not by Egypt, uh, but by things that Joseph probably wrote down and left in, in his diary. And then uh, Moses, of course, expanded on God's original revelation of the blood sacrifice of the ox, or, you know, of, the, uh, of an animal. And, and, of course, it says that God spoke to Moses face to face uh, mm -hmm. during those 40 years and wrote those, those books. Yeah. So there's a lot of literature. Uh, um, my, my new wife is Chinese, and, again, one of the things that brought us together. We went to a Chinese 
opera up at uh, town near here. And um, that was my big, uh, big expense, $75 per, per seat in the loges. The ones down on the floor were $250 a piece. We, we, went, the, we went the economy chair. <laughs> anyway, three times in this uh, story, and, and this, these are Chinese people from New York. They're not from communist China because as I was watching this, I thought, good grief, they are, it, it, this could never be put on in China because it's totally politically incorrect because they're telling uh, ancient stories of the Chinese people. But three times they had this huge screen that was about 40 feet across and 20 feet tall and they would show pictures on there and they would put the translation from Chinese into English of this opera and three times they mentioned Shangdi. And I sat up and looked at that and I thought, wow, that's incredible. And this was one of our first, you know, dates that we had. And I went home that night and I looked up because I had written 20 years before when we sponsored Chinese refugees from Vietnam, I'd written a whole program about Shangdi and read about it. And, and uh, you folks have had... Um, uh, Sure. Broadberry. Broadberry. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I read several of his books and put together this lesson. And I got home and I thought, is God trying to tell me something about this woman? Because she, uh, she was a Christian. Uh, Amy was a Christian. Uh, I knew that. And, and is he telling me something about China? You know, that maybe he has brought us together. We were, we were just started dating. Uh, that was another thing for me to give me peace about dating. So anyway, I looked, and I had done all kinds of research on Shangdi. I'd written three lessons on Shangdi and the, the ancient bone oracle Chinese literature, as I know you've had Broadbury there, you know, tells about the Garden of Eden, the fall of man, and uh, other histories that I went into and showed these young people uh, with the, uh, the Chinese families that we sponsored. We'd go there for Thanksgiving or, or Christmas party or get together and uh, the men would all go downstairs and play poker, <laughs> and I take the children. They had there were seven or eight children from anywhere from four to ten, and I take them and give them a lesson on Shangdi. And so uh, that really, really struck me when I, you know, I hadn't looked at this for maybe ten years until we went to this opera. So that was uh, a lot of literature in China uh, goes directly back to Shangdi and uh, tells about. Uh, the Garden of Eden and that incredible stuff. Shangdi is the Chinese name for God? Yeah. And Shangdi, when you break down the glyphs that make up his name, the Chinese glyphs, that means the God of three persons who came down from above to die on a tree as a sacrifice. Wow. Yeah. And that's, that's incredible. <laughs> Amy's um, sister-in-law passed away about uh, two months ago, and they asked me to do the funeral and that, and uh, and I gave a, about a 10-minute lesson on Shangdi, and we had been able to share that with her uh, family. So, yeah, uh, Shangdi is an incredible... On more, broadberry.org. It's Richard Broadberry's website. Broadberry.org. It's actually uh, hosted by TCCSA, so there's a link from our site, but you can go directly, broadberry.org. Okay, good, good.